Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation, to our Douglas and Sarah Allison Auditorium. We also welcome those who are joining us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. And for those here in-house, we ask that courtesy check that our cell phones or mobile devices have been turned off as a courtesy. And for those watching online, you're reminded you're welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. Leading our discussion today is Hans von Spakovsky. He is Senior Legal Fellow in our Edwin Meese III Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He is also Manager of Heritage's Election Law Reform Initiative. He is an authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration, as well as campaign finance, voter fraud, and voting rights laws. He served as a member of the Federal Election Commission for two years and has also served on electoral commissions at the state and local level. He was a counsel to the Att Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice and is also a former litigator, in-house counsel, and senior corporate officer in the insurance industry. Please join me in welcoming Hans von Spakovsky. Hans. Thanks, John. Uh, well, welcome to the Heritage Foundation, and um, I, I'm sure all of you are impressed with our incredible timing on this, given that there were uh, developments we're going to talk about uh, in this case uh, just this week on, on Monday. Um, the cases before the Supreme Court, Trump versus International Ref Refugee Assistance Project, and another case out of Hawaii, um, all are about uh, executive orders issued by the President. The first one on January 27th. Uh, instigated, implemented a temporary suspension of entry from certain uh, countries, seven countries, for 90 days and uh, refugees for 120 days while the Department of Homeland Security uh, reviewed in great depth its vetting procedures for entry from those particular countries. Uh, the seven countries selected were countries in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, uh, some of which have been designated as state sponsors of terrorism and others as countries of concern because they have uh, extensive terrorist activity. In March, uh, this, case, this uh, order was revised in a number of ways. Uh, it, the number was reduced to six countries um, and uh, other revisions were made to meet some of the um, concerns of courts uh, who had cons were considering challenges issued. There have been lawsuits filed all over the country, uh, in Hawaii, in Washington State, and a case out of the Fourth Circuit, that's this ca particular case that we're talking about. To tell you what kind of interest was generated by this case, I was actually looking at the slip opinion from the Fourth Circuit this morning, and the first 11 pages of the opinion are to list all of the different organizations, parties, and lawyers uh, involved in the case. Now, just on Saturday, uh, I'm sorry, I should say, oral arguments had been scheduled for October 11th, uh, just a very short time from now, which is why we organized this session today. Uh, but on Sunday, the President signed a new proclamation regarding this. Uh, and the proclamation lays out a new list of targeted countries. Five of the uh, prior countries targeted on the list but several new countries were added to it, including North Korea and Venezuela. Um, the new proclamation was issued because apparently the Department of Homeland Security has finished its review of its vetting procedures. It had developed a, a whole set of criteria that analyzed uh, countries and the information that they were providing, uh, how credible the information was they pr were providing, and they had applied it to 200 countries around the world and had come down to these uh, eight, eight countries. Now, the government has argued all along that the President's acting to protect national security and is fully within his constitutional and statutory authority, while challengers claim the executive orders are Muslim bans uh, and that the President is intentionally discriminating in violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. To discuss this, we have two experts on constitutional law and executive authority who frankly have very long and very impressive resumes. I'm just going to give you a very abbreviated um, introduction. Uh, first, Will Consovoy, who's a partner at Consovoy McCarthy Park and who has un uh, argued a number of cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He's a former law clerk uh, to Justice Clarence Thomas and to Judge Edith Jones of the Fifth Circuit. 
Uh, he's co-director of the Supreme Court Clinic and of the Administrative Law Clinic at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. He's got a BA from Monmouth University and a JD magna cum laude from George Mason. Uh, David Fontana, who we're also going to hear from, is an associate professor at the George Washington University School of Law. Uh, he clerked for Judge Dorothy Nelson of the Ninth Circuit and is the founder and organizer of the annual Comparative Constitutional Law Roundtable. He has a BA from the University of Virginia, uh, a great school, David. Uh, all three of my kids uh, have gone to school there. Wahoo. <laughs> and uh, where he was an Eccles Scholar, which is, I think that's the highest um, scholarship you can get from the uh, University of Virginia. And he's got a JD from Yale University. So we're going to start from, with Will, and I think we decided uh, you guys were going to speak from the, from the uh, panel. I think Charles. that's right. Sounds good. Uh, hopefully this will be more of a conversation than dueling lectures. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me here today. This is obviously a fascinating topic. Uh, it is a developing topic, which is challenging for us and uh, sort of changes the trajectory of where all of this may be headed. And I'm sure we'll talk about mootness and all of the issues around that as we go forward here today. But in my opening remarks to set the table, I kind of wanted to briefly touch on three main points. One is talk a little bit about how we got here, uh, what the arguments have been and what the arguments may be going forward. Uh, a little bit about how difficult I think it will be for the petitioners to win on their Establishment Clause claim. There's also a statutory claim. I'll save thoughts on that for a discussion if people are interested. It's a much more technical uh, issue. Um, and then talk a little bit more about uh, some of the deeper constitutional questions that are, that are at stake here. So how did we get here? I think it's important to take a step back for a few minutes and think about what was said about this order when it was issued. And I think it's fair to challenge the petitioners, uh, or I guess the petitioner here is the government, but the plaintiffs is what I mean to say, uh, to see if reality lived up to the rhetoric. So Hunt did a great job of explaining uh, the original order that has been revised twice now. Um, the original order was a 90-day suspension, so the government could engage in some review of seven countries that uh, no one disputes have particular problems with terrorism, uh, and it was asserted by the government had significant concerns about vetting, uh, and that's why they were selected. What happened after this temporary ban uh, so they could engage in some review uh, was issued. As Han said, lawsuits were filed pretty much everywhere by everybody about everything. So, um, and ultimately, even after it was revised to address some of the problems, the Ninth and Fourth Circuit struck it down. The Ninth on statutory grounds, the Fourth on constitutional grounds. Let me just tell you a little bit of what they said about this executive order. Uh, the Fourth Circuit said, although it speaks in terms of vague words of national security, uh, in context drips with religious intolerance, animus, and discrimination. Uh, one judge on the Ninth Circuit said he was proud to be part of a judicial system that is independent and courageous and that vigorously protects constitutional rights of all, regardless of the source of any efforts to weaken or diminish them. Another judge on the Fourth Circuit compared the executive order to Dred Scott and Korematsu. Uh, and w one of the counsel in the case uh, said that the government had not engaged in this type of mass dragnet exclusion in 50 years. That is the way this 90-day suspension was described. Uh, what has happened since then? The two lead plaintiffs, uh, one in the Fourth Circuit, one in the Ninth Circuit, their argument was that they were injured because close family members were being excluded from the country under this so-called Muslim ban. You might be surprised if you're not following the case closely to know that both of those family members have since been admitted to the country while the, while the ban was in place because of a case-by-case -case waiver system that the government explained at the beginning was available for people. Both were admitted. That raises important legal issues, but I think it makes an important practical point. Uh, is this Muslim ban uh, as it was described rhetorically by, the, by these judges? What happened next? The government did exactly what it said it was going to do, as Hans alluded to. It closely reviewed these issues. It engaged in a thorough review of over 200 countries' vetting procedures, and it ultimately resulted in a new order uh, that creates special restrictions 
for five of the six countries, but also for Venezuela, North Korea, and Chad. Um, I'm sure there's a theory as to why this is still a Muslim ban. Maybe we'll talk about it today. But I'm pretty confident that Venezuela and North Korea uh, aren't the targets of, of Muslim discrimination. But I can, maybe I'll be proven otherwise. Um, OK, so that's the background. And I think you, know, you can understand my point here, which is uh, when you describe something like Korematsu and Dred Scott, you better be right. Because I think your credibility is on the line when you say those kinds of things. Those are, those are sharp charges. Those are serious charges. Uh, and if you can't substantiate them, I think uh, people have every right to be skeptical about other things you're saying. Um, why do I think it's going to be very difficult for the plaintiffs to win the Establishment Clause claim? I thought it might be helpful to walk you through all of the things they're going to have to win on to win this claim. I'm going to quickly walk through them all. One, they have to show that they have standing. Only people in this country have standing to challenge this order. Some people claimed it on close family relationship. Those people, I think, have all been admitted now, although there's a debate about that. Uh, some of the other arguments are about tourism, the state of Hawaii's interest uh, in, in having people come over for academic reasons. They may win, they may lose, but it's an issue they have to deal with. Uh, then let's turn to the merits. Um, this executive order is facially neutral. Uh, it sets forth a non-discriminatory reason for why this order was issued. Ordinarily, that's a very good head start to winning a discrimination case. Uh, it's not a complete defense. Uh, there are cases, of course, where pretext or discriminatory purpose is underlying a neutral order. But I think it's fair to say that, particularly in the area of executive authority, that is an enormous hurdle to overcome. Uh, the Supreme Court has said that these kinds of national security orders should only be reviewed to make sure they are facially legitimate and that there's a bona fide reason for issuing it. I think if you look at this order and the reasons that were given for it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Um, but even if you get past that, even if the plaintiffs have standing, even if you uh, override the cases that say you really shouldn't look past the text of an executive order like this, uh, you still have to show that the primary purpose behind it was uh, anti-religious bias, uh, an Establishment Clause violation. That means they have to show statements, actions, uh, evidence of bias. Uh, ordinarily, when you're talking about a government action, the bias has to be on behalf of government actors. Here, this executive order was issued by the Office of the President. Uh, that means you would need official evidence from that office uh, to substantiate the claim. There really isn't very much of that here. Uh, there's a little bit, there's a few statements they have. I think it's fair to say the vast majority of the evidence comes from statements that then candidate Trump made on the campaign trail. That is an enormous hurdle, again, that they have to overcome to get the Supreme Court to be willing to look not just at government statements to undermine the facial uh, explanation, but look at campaign statements and not just statements by the president. I think one of the pieces of evidence they're looking at here is a statement that Rudy Giuliani made on a news program about a conversation that he had with the president. Uh, you couldn't get that evidence in the court in any case, let alone in a case in which you're trying to challenge an executive order on national security. But even if they get past all of that, they still have to show that the vast majority of the evidence proves that through this evidence, that the president was doing this for an anti-Muslim purpose. The problem is that the president clarified time and again that the reason for this was not to exclude Muslims. In fact, you couldn't think of a m perhaps more inept uh, order if that was the purpose. Uh, they didn't include uh, countries that were, of course, Muslim. Uh, Indonesia, to name, to name one. Uh, the evidence from the campaign is at best equivocal. And I would find it deeply troubling if the United States Supreme Court ruled that an executive order that the president said was necessary for national security is unconstitutional because they decided on their own that some statements he made while a candidate in their mind shows that he had some bias, even though the order is clearly neutral on its face and even though 
uh, the reasons given were, were legitimate. And the way to think about this is, I think, and I'd be curious to hear what, what uh, Dave says, is if this order, if everything else had happened here, had been done by President Obama or any other president, would it be an establishment clause violation? I think most people have said no, which means this entire thing comes down to a judicial reading of campaign statements to issue a major constitutional ruling. I just think that's uh, really difficult. I think they're going to have a hard time succeeding. And I think if they do, I don't think this will bode well for the future. I think we can all think of statements other people have made, whether it's about uh, other religious groups, <coughs> about people of a political, particular political ide ideology, about gun owners. Uh, are we really prepared to have active federal court litigation every time a president issues an order uh, or there's legislation and saying, we want to review all the statements these people have made in their prior life before they came into office uh, so we can challenge it. Now, maybe some of those will fall short. They won't have enough evidence to prove it. Maybe some of them will be winners, uh, but it'll be litigated. Uh, the parties here sought uh, massive discovery from the administration, including depositions of all the key White House personnel. That's what we're looking at, I think, going forward if this kind of argument uh, succeeds. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, we filed my law firm on behalf of the Southeastern Legal Foundation an amicus brief uh, in the case urging the court not to go down that road uh, and to stick with precedent. Uh, and we hope they do. Um, but obviously, it's now clouded by issues of whether the court will even hear the case. And we'll, of course, talk about that as well. So with that. Well, thanks, David. Okay. Sure. Well, things that I thought would never happen in my life. One of them was I never thought I would come to the Heritage Foundation to defend religious freedom from the Heritage Foundation. But here I am, and that's what I'll argue. Um, I did not play any formal role in the case except signing on to one amicus brief. And so, you know, as an academic, my role in discussing this is much more, you know, analyst and advocate. So I want to talk to you about the issues, why I ultimately conclude what I conclude, but some of the flaws with those arguments, too, and, you know, following kind of the lead of the discussion of the panel so far, I'll focus mostly on establishment clause issues and what the order this week means. And I want to play this kind of on Heritage Foundation grounds, not on, you know, American Constitution Society grounds. I want to argue about why this presents some constitutional issues using arguments made by Justices Alito, Thomas Scalia, and Justice Gorsuch when he was on the Tenth Circuit. Um, and use kind of those principles and those arguments to talk about some of the constitutional issues this presents and then why some of the things this week I don't think changes the nature of the arguments. You know, it's the same sort of arguments, but changes some of the magnitude of the claims being made. And then just some, some responses. I mean, I agree with that all the words that you used were words that I probably would order them <laughs> differently. So um, apart from that, I agree. Yeah, there is a case. There was a case. So, um, so first, let me talk about the Establishment Clause, right? There is a basic principle in the Establishment Clause jurisprudence that's been cited and agreed on many times by Thomas, Scalia, Alito, Gorsuch on the Tenth Circuit. I would say the academic most responsible for identifying the historical roots of this was Michael McConnell, who was a George W. Bush appointee to the Tenth Circuit, now a law professor. So if there's the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause means one thing, it's that you can't single out a particular religion for unfavorable treatment. At minimum, that's what it means. It might mean more than that, but that's at minimum what it means. And to see whether or not government action singles out a particular a religious faith for unfavorable treatment, we look to what the people doing it thought they were doing it and what the thing they did actually did. Right? So we looked at kind of intention and action. So let's first talk about intention. Right? The very well-established you know, standard, which I think originally comes from um, an opinion by Scalia, is the reasonable observer standard. What would somebody looking at what the people are saying they were doing. What would the person looking at that, the average person on the street, let's exclude the average person on DC because nobody here is average. Let's assume the average person you know, in the rest of America, what would they think the government's doing here? Do they think that the government will single out a particular religion for disfavorable treatment? The way that we establish intent in law, not just in constitutional law, but in criminal law and bankruptcy law and all sorts of areas of laws, we look to things that people said at different points in different contexts. Right? So there are many, many cases, some in the Supreme Court, some in the lower court, some in state courts, in which we look at what political actors said right before they were taking an action, as they were taking an action, or a long time before it. If you wanted to know who I am, would you decide that you only want to know what I said yesterday or today? You want to know what I said a long time ago. There are Supreme Court cases, there are lower court cases. 
looking at governors and things that governors said during their campaigns, that state officials and what state officials said during the campaign, and things that they did while in office. There are criminal cases, including the trial of Senator Menendez now in New Jersey, where we look at things that candidates did during their campaign and things that they did after they were in office. This is all a way of ascertaining what the intent was behind a particular action. This is not some, the thing that's novel about it is applying it to the, pres the president, but this idea that we consider things said for a while in many contexts is as established in criminal law, constitutional law, as any idea of ascertaining intent is. If you want to know what the reasonable observer thinks that the immigration orders were supposed to do, at least the first two, one way might be, you know, we can't impanel a jury of 310 million people. Let's do a, a rel relatively scientific poll. Most of the polling that I've seen sat, found between 75 and 80 percent of people thought that the primary goal of this was to exclude Muslims from the United States. That's more than just one reasonable observer. That's a poll that's meant to replicate what almost every American thinks. The other way of trying to figure out whether or not what the government's doing is meant to target a particular religion for disfavorable treatment is to look at what it actually does, right? So let's talk about kind of travel ban 1.0, travel ban 2.0, right? These were targeted at countries that were almost exclusively Muslim. It doesn't matter that there are Muslims elsewhere. It doesn't matter that there were a few people in those countries that weren't Muslim. If it's targeted at an institution or a country that's almost exclusively Muslim, that's a reasonable way to determine whether or not it's religious discrimination. So let me give you an example, right? Let's say that I said, you know, I'm discriminating against 10 people because they're white and one person because they're black. What's that? What? Oh, closer, okay. I thought I'm so loud that everybody can hear. <laughs> uh, if I discriminate against 10 people because they're white and one person because they're black, does it mean that I didn't discriminate against the 10 people because they're white because there was also one person who was black? If I discriminate against 10 people because they're white, but there are also you know, a few hundred other million people in the country who are white that I discriminate, didn't discriminate against, does that mean I didn't discriminate against the 10 people because they're white? So the initial order and the fact that it applied just to countries that were almost exclusively Muslim, I think was a reason for inferring that the, that the order was targeted at a particular religion. Let's talk about what the new order means, right? There's a great phrase from one establishment clause case by Justice Souter, which you know, says you can't have a forever taint, right? You can't be that something that somebody did once means that you know, they can't do anything in the future, right? So it just can't be. I don't think anybody, I don't speak for everybody, I don't think most people would say that something that Trump said during the campaign means he can't do anything about this forever. An emphasis on both, and he can't do anything and forever, right? There have to be some limits, right? And so the question is with this new order, has enough time passed and are enough other countries included that it removes that taint? It's not a forever taint, has the taint passed, right? And by the way, this wasn't just statements by Trump and some of the amicus briefs, there are statements by 13 different executive branch officials all made after inauguration. That's not just tweets during a presidential campaign. So if let's say that the new executive order applied to 30 Western European countries that were majority Christian, then it would be really hard to argue that this is a Muslim ban, right? The fact that it applies just to three countries, Venezuela, it's not really doing that much. It just applies to government officials. North Korea, it's not doing all that much. Chad, it is doing something, right? So does the fact that it kind of applies a little bit more remove the initial taint? That's really the question for travel ban 3.0. Again, if I discriminate against 10 people because they're white, if I start discriminating against a lot of other people because they're black, well, that, you know, at a certain point, you might question whether the, your assessment that I was discriminating against the initial group because they're white is true, right? Enough no, other my actions might make you question my discriminatory intent. Where do we draw the line between, you know, all of Western Europe being included, disproving the taint, and kind of countries that don't really do that much and aren't really implicated by this order not removing the taint? The other thing that's significant, given how important intention is in this area of law, is that there, was, there were no other statements accompanying this, right? As silly as it might sound to the non-legal observer, right? This stuff really matters a lot for constitutional doctrine, whether it should or not is another conversation. But, you know, all nine justices, Gorsuch on the Tenth Circuit, all the other eight have said at one point in time, intention matters for establishment clause. So if Trump and all of his officials had said things this week about it, that could really change how the executive order looks, right? So the big questions for travel ban 3.0 and establishment clauses, you know, do these three other countries remove the forever taint? A few other just res specific responses. Um, I don't, you know, we're talking about these people were admitted anyway. Well, they were admitted anyway, I think people would argue, because 
the ban was suspended. We don't know what would have happened if the ban was in place. So there's no way of saying this generated no harm when it was enforced because it was never fully enforced. Second thing, the doctrine is not primary purpose. There are a lot of cases saying essential purpose. So, you know, it doesn't have to be the only thing. It could be that 80% um, concerned about discriminating against Muslims and 20% national security. It could be 51, 49, it could be 49, 51. It just has to be an essential purpose. The standard is not primary purpose, right? And on the national security judgment, you can't use one part of the Constitution to violate another part of the Constitution, right? The Commander-in-Chief cannot say, I'm the Commander-in-Chief so I can violate the First Amendment. I can take all your guns because I'm the President, right? So the question here is, does the First Amendment limit his power to set immigration rules? And what also changed with this new order is, you know, as Hans was saying in the introduction, process, right? It's much harder to argue that this was arbitrary now. If national security and immigration can ever override our First Amendment rights, it would be because the president thought about this in the deliberative process, and the argument for that is certainly stronger now than it was with 1.0, 2.0. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks. All right, we're going to uh, uh, take questions from the audience, and a couple things. I, I should have made clear, I meant to do that at the beginning, that uh, for those of you who don't know, that the Supreme Court on Monday issued an order because of the Sunday uh, proclamation from the president with these new countries and outlining what they were doing. On Monday, the Supreme Court issued an order in this case uh, canceling the oral arguments and asking the parties on both sides to uh, file supplemental letter briefs by, I think, October 5th, right? I think that sounds yeah. right. Yeah. I, I think by October 5th, I don't know. That, that in essence uh, asked the parties to uh, brief them on this order, how it may change the case, and in particular, whether it moots the, the case, which would uh, lead the court to dismiss it. So uh, we're, we, we will learn more when the parties um, file that. Now, uh, for questions, I would ask you if you would wait for the uh, microphone to come around. Um, have we got some microphones? Yes, we do. Uh, wait for the microphone to come around because we are broadcasting this live on the internet and uh, if you don't speak into a mic, uh, no one in the rest of America will be able to hear your question. And I would ask you, uh, one, to identify yourself, and two, please ask a question, and then don't give a speech, because uh, the whole point of this is so that you can hear from two very knowledgeable experts on their opinions on this. So uh, any questions? Yes, here in front. Uh, my name is Joel. It, it's on. Some years ago, unless I'm mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, the Supreme Court ruled that the Fourth Amendment and Miranda warnings don't protect foreigners in foreign countries. Now, all of these potential plaintiffs are foreigners in foreign countries. They're not, unlike Korematsu, citizens of the United States. Where do they have any right under the Constitution to insist that they've got a right whatever the reason they're being excluded. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the claim is that they have a right to come here. The claim is that the reason for being, there are certain reasons that are unacceptable for why they can't, right? So it's not that I have a right to be admitted to the University of Michigan, it's that you can't deny me admission to the University of Michigan because of my race, right? So it's not that I have a right to come to the United States, but it's that you can't deny me admission because I'm Muslim. Um, yeah. Well, the First Amendment doesn't talk, we could, I mean, we could talk yeah. about the original understanding text, but it doesn't say anything in the First Amendment about that. But, I, right. I have well. a slightly different read on this. Um, I actually think everyone agree, stipulates, the litigants do, that they don't have rights. You're correct. The arguments here for standing have been made on the people in the United States being injured by it. So uh, the plaintiffs, there are several different classes of plaintiffs here. There are some individuals who are claiming that they are being denied uh, the rights of their family to enter the country. And the Supreme Court, in its ruling granting a partial stay, said it was not going to stay the order for people uh, in that category. I'm going to I'm going to be missing some important details here, but I'm just trying to keep this fairly high level. The state of Hawaii has brought a claim saying that it is injured, both in its sovereign capacity and also because it has people who are being kept out of the country who are going to teach at its universities, things like that. So it's suffering an injury. Um, and then there are some uh, organizations who are claiming injury on behalf of their members. Uh, all of this gets really complicated, but all of it is to agree with your basic premise. But I don't think that, at least as far as the court is concerned, 
is the end of the story. That's more the beginning of, of the story. Mark, I think you had your hand up. Right. Mark Krikorian, Center for Immigration Studies. Isn't really the question before you get to the Establishment Clause issue a statutory question? Because the statute says the President may exclude any alien or any class of aliens. It says any class of aliens. Now, so isn't really the first issue whether the statute itself is unconstitutional? I mean, it seems to me that's the issue that has to be dealt with at first and that um, the rest of it is secondary to that basic issue of whether Congress had the authority to, to give the president that authority at all. So, so the answer is yes in the sense that uh, the statutory question is, is really important here and it intersects with constitutional arguments, not just the Establishment Clause argument, but separation of powers arguments that are moving in two different directions. You have some people arguing raising concerns that could Congress delegate this power to the president. You have other people raising concerns that says, uh, we have to read the statutes to not interfere with the president's foreign affairs powers. And so how you read the statutes, I think, is implicated by these constitutional questions. I don't think either side is arguing th uh, that the statutes are unconstitutional, at least other than background avoidance arguments. I think there is a serious disagreement about what the statutes mean. I'm not surprisingly persuaded by the administration's reading of these statutes. I think the statute you identify, which I think is 1182F, uh, is pretty clear about the, the vast authority the president has here, uh, and the arguments that these other statutes, which say no discrimination on the basis, basis of national origin, religion, have to be read in light of that statute and not to overrule or supersede it. But it's a big issue. But the Fourth Circuit didn't reach it. Fourth Circuit did on constitutional grounds. The argument the Ninth Circuit has reached on, the party never actually really argued. They went on their own yeah. on a different statutory argument, and I think it's now being defended. I, I personally find it a, a difficult argument to defend. But if you reject the, the plaintiff's argument on the statute, you are going to have to read the, reach the constitutional issues. I agree about the ordering of the issues. I think you first have to see, does the president have a power delegated by Congress to do this in the first place? And then if so, is that constitutional? I think that's been some of the problems with arguments made by the lawyers, the way the courts frame the issue just in their opinion. So I agree with that. You know, unsurprisingly, I have a different conclusion in reading the statutes about whether there is a statutory grant to the president. Usually when there's a potential tension between two statutes, 1152 and 1182 here, one saying the president can do almost anything he wants, the other saying he can't do it just on the basis of nationality. We go with later in time, more specific over vague. There's plenty of legislative history and other stuff from the second statute saying the you can't do it based on nationality because that's overly broad. In fact, there are more people indicted and convicted of terrorism crimes from the Arlington and Alexandria area than there were from some of these countries that you know, people were excluded from. I think that you know, there's also the argument in this, the later in time statute that any nationality-based bans are supposed to be temporary, the new order is permanent, and there's also the argument in this later statute in the history and then some other parts of the statute beyond 1152 and 1182 that there has to be, um, the presumption has to be in favor of admittance, not in favor of denying, and here it's a blanket ban on admittance. So that's the argument, but I absolutely agree that, you know, if this was my constitutional law class and I was reading an examination, I would, you know, mark it down substantially for not considering whether there was a grant of power in the first place. The normal ordering is, do you have a grant of power? And if so, does it violate some other thing? So I think that's, to me, a clear argument. Yeah. If I can uh, interrupt you to ask a question, um, and I wonder actually what both of you think about this. Uh, the the uh, Supreme Court, uh, the, the, the conservative majority on there has a tendency when they get cases from the Ninth Circuit and they're going to overrule the Ninth Circuit to often adopt the dissenting opinions written uh, in the Ninth Circuit. And I wonder, there, as you all know, there was a very extensive dissent written by, I think, five justices of the Ninth Circuit uh, in, in large measure ca castigating, uh, castigating the rest of the Ninth Circuit uh, on this particular issue, particularly this statute. And I wonder whether you think if the court is going to uh, overrule the Ninth Circuit in this, whether you think they might adopt most of the arguments in that Ninth Circuit dissent? It's hard to say. I mean, I, I, historically, yes, I think there has been a tendency to read those dissents quite carefully. Um, uh, cases come to mind, but parents involved is certainly one yeah. in which the dissent by, by um, Judge Bea uh, and Judge O'Scanlan there had a real impact on how that case came down at the Supreme Court. But it's not always the case. Those dissents are a little bit interesting in that 
the decision that they were really upset with, which was a prior, the Washington right. decision, was I think they were really agitated by the establish, Establishment Clause uh, suggestions. They were really only suggestions in that opinion. They didn't rule on the issue because of the, the emergency posture it was in. So I think they actually read out against the Fourth Circuit opinion uh, there. I know there was some discussion of the statute. On statutory questions, I tend to think that the, uh, the court goes its own way uh, on that and doesn't look as much to, to lower court opinions, but every case is different. Yeah, I mean, I largely agree. You know, having clerked on the Ninth Circuit, I would say, Hans, what you call castigating, the judges there just call talking. Like <laughs> the, it's a very fractious circuit. I, for one, have thought it should be split. How to do it, you know, whether I trust a particular member of Congress to do it, those are separate questions. It's, it's chaos. But uh, so it is normal, but we, even when they adopt it, they kind of water down the language, you know. Um, here, you know, given what's going on with Travel Ban 3.0, I, you know, it's hard to imagine them looking to these earlier decisions. Whatever we get at the end of the day, if there's a Supreme Court decision on the merits and travel ban 3.0, I just can't imagine the language will be as aggressive as the Fourth and Ninth Circuit opinions were in majority and dissent. You know, we were talking in the conference room beforehand about how little activity there is on both sides since the new executive order, pro and con, and I think that reflects that attention has either been redirected or there's been an air conditioner in the room on this issue. So whatever we get, I expect it to be a little calmer on um, both sides than it was in the kind of 1.0 and 2.0 rounds. All right, any questions? Yeah, here in the front. Wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Kambi Bhatt. I'm with the Pakistani Spectator. And uh, my question is that why doesn't Department of State declare Pakistan as a terrorist state if it's treating Pakistan as a terrorist state, because nobody is getting visa from Pakistan, and I talk with, as a journalist, I talk with the, the Department of State, and I mean, you know, they didn't give me official position, but somebody who is higher up, he told me that everybody knows that we are mess with Pakistan, but we cannot declare it as a terrorist state, but we are just treating it as a terrorist state. So my question is, doesn't it, give like that we are not very principled and it's kind of hypocrisy or we are too coward uh, to act on whatever we believe. Thanks. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I would say two things. One is that I don't think anybody would think that the standards for deciding whether a state is a terrorist state is a purely legal question as opposed to one completely intermixed with politics and foreign policy. So that might be part of the reason why it's not just satisfying a legal standard. The question about travel ban 3.0 to, you know, kind of the constitutional dimension of a lot of what you're asking is the inclusion of some countries like Chad, which maybe don't have the record of supporting terrorist activity, and the exclusion of still other countries that seem to have more of a record than some that are included. And so, you know, that will be one of the constitutional questions is how perfectly matched does this need to be? Do you have to include all the countries that meet this criteria, some, most, right? That's, I think, the constitutional dimension of a lot of what you're asking. Does it matter that some countries you think would, should, would be included are included? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything uh, more to add directly on the, on the Pakistan question, but it did raise something, or something I wanted to get back to that they had mentioned earlier, which is this issue of the taint of it. And so what was the country that was removed? Was it Sudan? Was the one of the Sudan, right. yeah, this so, round. Yeah. So imagine tomorrow literally tomorrow, there was a credible threat of a terrorist attack from Sudan. And the president had to make a change and put Sudan back on the list. Right. Uh, I think under your argument, or the way you see the, that issue, he has a real up, he's going to have to go into court and defend, to, you know, uh, putting up a gate, uh, around, you know, not letting people from Sudan in the country over an active terrorist threat, and that the court will have to decide whether the that he's so tainted that the Establishment Clause bars the president from taking that action. Well, I, of course he's going to have to go in the court. The question is, is he going to win, right? I mean, right, but so I, right, I think gonna, he's yeah. going to have standing. Somebody's going to have standing unless he declared a political question. Of course it's going to go in the court, right? The question mm -hmm. is who should win. Right, but, well, I, yeah. I think you're right, but I think that, to me, to my mind, highlights why this is such a unique area, different than all other Establishment Clause litigation. Yeah. You have the president exercising there essentially a war power not just a foreign affairs power. And we almost never in this country uh, think that the president has to go into court during an active military issue to, def yeah. to defend himself on those grounds. And maybe you're right that that's how it would play out, but to me that is uh, evidence that we're going down the wrong road. 
I mean, I think we do have cases where courts have sat in review, but it's almost always the case you're right after the most heated moment, you know, of the conflict. Hamdi and Hamdan are not to 2004, they're not in 2001. So to have courts sitting in review in the most intense moments of a crisis would be historically unusual. But it can't be the case that the president could violate First Amendment rights by flipping a coin, right? I would assume some sort of review with some sort of evidence would suffice, but there would have to be some sort of review, right? We would just because the president said, you know, I think uh, Sudan, no, uh, Poland, no, Czech Republic, I'm going to flip a coin, okay. Had Sudan, you know, there has to be some evidentiary basis for making that statement. It would get into court, it would be deferential review, whether they would win would, you know, depend on the particulars, but I don't think people would say courts can't do anything and a president could flip a coin. The question is where to draw the line between, you know, flipping the coin and Sudan's got a, you know, a bomb right outside the Heritage Center right now that they're about to let out. Right, so, so I think, I think, uh, where that line is drawn is with the deferential review. And I think yeah. that's what's being, the, the president's being deprived of when, when we're engaging in this kind of inquiry. I don't think anything that the Fourth Circuit or Ninth Circuit did here looked anything like an agency. <laughs> I, I, issuing a mundane regulation would get more deference than the president well, got here on a huge national security issue. I'll take more questions. But the language is bona fide and legitimate, bona fide by dictionary and by law means sincere, genuine, not a pretext. Legitimate means on the face. It doesn't, you know, discriminate. I think neither of those was met. So I think the biggest case for deference, which is Mandel from, what, 72 or 73, doesn't really apply here. But we don't yeah. get well, the particulars. Right. Yeah. All right, another question? I should point out, by the way, for those, uh, and then we'll go to Art. You got a question? Um, I should point out that for those of you who actually have, have read the proclamation on Sunday, that I thought it was very interesting that um, it turned out that of the 200 countries that uh, DHS did a review of to see whether they're providing uh, good information and doing it on a credible basis, that initially they came up with a list of 47 countries that were potentially uh, had a risk Surprising or list, were too. were. Uh, uh, b potential problems, and the, the proclamation describes a 50-day period in which the Department of Homeland Security uh, contacted all of those countries, and apparently the list was winnowed down from 47 to 8 because many of the countries that were, were in the list of 47 uh, uh, gave assurances and commitments to improve the information that they were providing, and that, so then it went down to, to eight countries. But Art? Uh, Professor Fontana, your colleague John Banzaf would always proudly talk about U.S. versus scrap and about the standing yeah. that had been set forth in that and about how that was basically the high watermark that we would ever have and that nobody's ever going to find standing quite that broad. Would you say that the standing in uh, the two circuit court cases, fourth and ninth, are broader than that in scrap, that they've reached a little bit further. Hawaii has accepted, I think, 10 refugees over the last 10 years, and therefore, you know, that it has standing with respect to refugees. I think, you know, part of why the standing issue is hard, you know, most of the arguments that we're talking about don't really matter, whether it was Hawaii or a private party or the university <laughs> or something, because, you know, the Establishment Clause claims are what they are. But I think the standing issues really depend on the particular plaintiffs here. And I do think some are more strong than others. But you really only have to prove one person has standing to get a case. And I think there's more than one, partly because, you know, and this is like I said, you know, the kind of the Nixon comes to China, me coming to Heritage Foundation, there's very flexible standards for establishment clause standing. So there might not have been the sort of harm sufficient to trigger standing in other areas of constitutional law. But there is a nexus between standing and merits. And I think for establishment clause, there have been pretty flexible standards. And there's enough here to give at least one party standing. Right. You know, on the mootness question, you know, the thing, I, I honestly don't know what I think about the mootness one, because it seems obvious that this is now moot. But if you read 3.0, unlike, I think, 2.0, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not totally confident about this, but I don't think 3.0, like, repeals 2.0, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd have to think more, is there, like, anything in 2.0 that's still stands after 3.0, my instinct is no, but right. there's nothing like explicit in there. Apart from that, it's hard to see how 2.0 is, is not moot and the issue is really, what do you do with the lower court decisions from 2.0? But I can't imagine that 2.0 continues. Yeah, there's obviously a serious mootness question yeah. here. I haven't run it all the way to the ground either. I know there's some differences also in the restrictions themselves. Yeah. I think students got a different 
yeah, deal than they got under 2.0, yeah. but I'm not an expert. I do think, to your question, though, that I personally think standing is really in doubt here. Now, this is sort of goes to the trajectory of the case. If you look at the Supreme Court's order where it partially stayed this, to me it seems like standing was probably the reason where the court drew the line. Because if you think about it from a merits perspective, yeah. it would be odd that people with a close family connection had a winning establishment clause claim, but people, the other classes of plaintiffs, like the states and these other things, didn't. It's more likely that the court, the five majority, thought they probably might have standing. Yeah. Probably might not the best way to put something. Yeah. But, uh, uh, or, and the rest didn't. If you think about the order in that respect, I think, and this is where the details of the case may escape me, I think all the people who fit into that first category have now been admitted. I'm not sure there are any, but is there anybody left who fit to that close family connection category that's still not been admitted on the case by case waiver? There may be, and I could be, but I think that's where the the, the battle is joined. I do am skeptical that these other sort of more derivative injuries are likely to find an audience of five at the court if the court doesn't for three point thing. oh for, for three point oh yeah, yeah. yeah yeah or even right. for no I even think for. For two Back for 2.0. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not now. But the combination of okay. standing and mootness here yeah. seems to make it difficult to see Hard how the court's going to get to the yes. to the merits. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up yeah. question? Because, of course, uh, Klein Eats versus Mandel was just the latest in a series of cases that yeah. have gone back you know, 40, 50, 60 years that talked about the plenary power of Congress to exclude individuals. Uh, given how broad the standing was in these cases, wouldn't that sort of swallow that rule? Wouldn't, if I can say that I have a family member in the United States that, you know, it's really the family member that you're looking to, so who cares whether Congress has plenary power to exclude me because there's some right that that individual has that needs to be respected by the court. I'm not sure I entirely understand, you know, the relationship between the merits and the standing, but, you know, I think in, in travel ban 2.0, I might not agree with the standing arguments by all of them, but some of them, yes. And then I think for 3.0, I'm sure there'll be new plaintiffs, right? Yeah, and so see. it's not going to be the same plaintiffs. The plenary power, you know, plenary power does not mean mm -hmm. unlimited power. There's, you know, there's a strong constitutional tradition in case law and Madison and Hamilton that you can't use one part of the Constitution to violate the other part of the Constitution, then you don't really have a Constitution, right? So the plenary power does not mean the unlimited power, and there's plenty of support for limitations, and the question, you know, would be does the person assert the sort of harm that's within those limitations and the plenary power? If the executive order said anybody who owns a gun cannot be admitted to the United States anymore, anybody who's white can't be admitted to the United States anymore, you know, that will probably cause the court some discomfort, that will probably generate some sort of standing. So plenary is not, you know, unlimited and never really has been, I think. And it's more executive, right? I mean, it's a, it's a grant to the executive. And in ex immigration at law, at least, we tend to construe, this is what's complicated about the statutory issue. We have the constitutional avoidance. We want to interpret the statute to avoid constitutional problems on the one hand. On the other hand, we tend to construe congressional grants to the executive branch and immigration law pretty broadly. So you have these two competing, you know, interpretive norms. Uh, any other questions? Right there. Jorge Scori is my name. Um, I found really interesting what you had to say about Sudan, uh, being the country that was on and then came off, and you spoke of a hypothetical threat uh, from Sudan. Um, and it made me think of the recent shooting in Tennessee. Do you think that'll have any implications, since it, since it may have been carried out by a Sudanese man? Yeah, I, I haven't followed, you know, I, I don't know the details there as well to comment on it publicly, I, I would say. Um, so I don't, I was making a hypothetical example, uh, but I guess the general point, getting away from any particular case is, national security needs change rapidly. And if the court is going to commit to being engaged at this level on these issues and revisiting the judgments made, uh, and I'm not suggesting that they don't have the Article Three power to, to do so, they, they may think they do, uh, but that is a massive commitment. I think the Guantanamo Bay cases were also a massive commitment. The court was prepared to make it. Uh, and they are continuing to live with that decision uh, to this day. Uh, once the court uh, commits to supervising national security decisions, 
on a, on a very granular basis, that is an enormous commitment by a relatively small branch of government. And I think there's appropriately some hesitation. It doesn't mean they're going to, to not do it. I think recent ex experience suggests they might. But it's worth taking a pause to think about. Yeah, two quick final things. Um, one is, you know, the, the hypothetical that's just always difficult that I use in class all the time, and there's no great answer to this, is the ticking time bomb scenario. So to go to the Sudan example, let's say the president gets credible intelligence, then in the next five days, somebody from Sudan is going to come off, come into the country and let off a bomb right outside the White House. In that situation, can he issue an executive order suspending just people from Sudan coming, right? Would that be constitutional, right? And the way that courts always deal with this is they say, well, there's no, the time bomb isn't really ticking, right? It's not going to, they're not going to come in five days. But in that situation, that would be an enormously difficult situation. In that situation, would you really trust the president to, ha to be able to do that with no judicial review? Probably not. How about very deferential judicial review? And so the combination of deferential judicial review and saying there hasn't really been a ticking time bomb is where the law kind of is on this. The second thing is, you know, there's a classic argument in law, particularly when we're talking about things like, you know, categories of people based on their religion or numbers, you know, is it's so hard to draw a line here. So if it's so hard to draw a line, does that mean you don't draw a line at all? At all or you just say, this is really hard to draw, right? So uh, the forever taint problem, does that mean that taint doesn't exist? No. Does it mean that taint lasts forever? No. Where's the line between never and forever? That is an extremely difficult question, but that's a question that the law usually tries to resolve, right? And so that's kind of where I think the consensus has been on Establishment Clause issues among Alito, Scalia, Thomas, Gorsuch on the Tenth Circuit, and the liberal justices, is that the taint can't be forever, but exists, and we have to engage in a very context-specific inquiry and where the line exists, right? And so that's the same sort of thing on national security, right? I don't think that I want my courts, if there's a time bomb, you know, if there's a ticking time bomb outside the White House that's going to go off in five minutes, I don't want the Supreme Court saying, you can't do anything until we could schedule arguments in October. We're busy traveling around Europe right now. We can't get to this. Give us a few months, right? That's, but it's never, we haven't come to that situation. If we did, it would be a tough one, and you would win. What it would look like would depend, right? Would they not hear it? Would they hear it and just issue some pro forma thing? No standing. No standing. <laughs> and, you know, we do have something, the closest we have to this is like, maybe not the closest, but an example of what courts do sometimes when they have something super urgent in the real world. It's like ex parte Quirin, which is a Supreme Court case in World War II, or just what the Kenyan court did about their presidential election. They issue a quick decision and they write the opinion later. Yeah. It doesn't always lead to the best opinion, but that's one way that they deal with it. They might say, you know, president, go get them and we'll f find the legal principles later to justify it. That might be how the world works. So. <laughs> uh, we've got time for one more question, but I, I, I wonder if I could take the moderator's prerogative and, and ask it myself. And, sure. and, and I wonder whether you all, whether the two of you believe that one of the problems caused in, in this whole uh, case and the confusion, I think, perhaps amongst, amongst the public and others about this, is the fact that um, one of the questions that I often get when I'm talking about this issue is um, confusion caused by the fact that people will say, well, they don't understand why these particular countries were picked because they will talk about um, uh, the, the issue that, for example, Saudi Arabia was not picked. And there have been terrorist um, incidents uh, involving people from Saudi Arabia. And they say, well, why weren't they on the list? But is the confusion caused by the fact that um, the countries picked were not based solely on the nationalities of people who've been engaged in terrorist acts, but by the fact that um, the countries were picked because the president and the government were saying uh, what we were looking at was not where the particular countries um, and the nationalities of terrorists, but the fact that, for example, we have a relationship with the Saudi government in which we can trust the information we're getting from the government and intelligence sources there on people coming in. Whereas the countries that were picked were because we can't trust the information we're getting from the government. Or it was a country like Somalia where there, the, the government has broken down right. and there is no information that we, we can really trust that we're getting from that. Is that part of the confusion here? I don't know whether it's confusion or um, lack of insight, but I do think that 
as I understand the justification, was that informational concerns was essential to the decision. It was a combination of, of countries where there was a, a significant terrorism risk combined with among those countries which ones we were having problems getting the kind of information needed to make an informed judgment about whether to admit somebody. Now, to, add, to say that is to say the other side has arguments on the other side, and that's why we're here having a forum, and that's why we have a huge Supreme Court case. I guess for me, though, in the, in the minute I have left would be to say, um, I think one of the big questions in cases like this, and David did a great job of raising some of these hypotheticals, is whether we're going to trust in these decisions and how much are we willing to trust uh, the pr when we give uh, the president enormous authority in an area, particularly like national security, we're required to have some trust that it's going to be exercised appropriately. And what I think cases like Mandel and Din are saying is that we're going to have to trust here because the court is not in a position to second-guess these kinds of judgments. So yes, there has to be a facially legitimate reason. I think there was. I think it sounds like David thinks there wasn't. But that's, a, that's an inquiry a court can engage in, whether the, that is within the court's expertise. Second, whether there were bona fide reasons given for the exclusion. So there's nothing in the order that says, I'm doing this because of a flip of a coin or because I had a bad day or because I feel like it and want to see how far I can go. They laid out a rationale that was clearly based on national security. But again, I think the court has the capacity to evaluate those reasons on those terms. The question is whether the court has the capacity and the appetite to ov override that based on sort of more traditional Establishment Clause case law like Lemon and go behind all of that and look at and try to essentially look into the president's heart and make a judgment about what he was trying to do and in so doing overturn uh, what the country thought, what the executive thought was an important national security order. That's where I'm hoping the court will take a step back. I think others hope the court will take a step forward and uh, we shall see. So one quick thing on this and then on the, the nationality point. So um, I, you know, I have a few things to do after this, but if before 5 o'clock today I could go around town and find hundreds of people in administrative agencies and in criminal cases in D.C. trying to figure out what government officials were thinking. It's called intention. It's a pretty established concept in law. We've done it for the executive branch. We've done it for the president. We've done it for agencies. We've done it for Congress. We've done it for governors. We're doing it for senators in the New Jersey trial right now. Rather than revolutionary, this is pretty established. But on the nationality thing, I think there are two arguments on both kind of extreme sides, and then to me there's the real question in the middle. So, you know, the, one of the arguments made was that nationality just is not predictive of the sort of national security threats that could justify an order like this. This was an argument that some of the lawyers made. This was in the Department of Homeland Security report that people used to challenge travel ban 1.0, 2.0, where they said nationality wasn't a basis. On the other kind of extreme, and I don't use the extreme label pejoratively, but just to kind of situate the arguments, is the Pakistan question, right? Um, which is, is my response to the Pakistan question is, well, you know, this is a foreign policy decision, too, in which we should defer to the president rather than a league. It doesn't imagine the factual correlation between, you know, Saudi Arabian nationality and terrorism. That question itself is a policy question, not just a legal question. In the middle is something like courts love to do is means and fit, right? Is that how inclusive or exclusive does this need to be? Do you have to include all countries where people from there seem to have committed terrorism? 50%, 75%, 25%, and that's really where a lot of the courts, the majority and the dissenting and the lower courts were debating, right? They were saying there are countries that were left off the list that might be, like Saudi Arabia. There were countries that were included that maybe shouldn't be, like Chad or something, right? And the question is how precise does that ha fit have to be between you know, the country and whether or not it poses a threat and what the order did. And that's really a lot of the debate here. Nobody thinks 0% is OK. Nobody thinks 100% OK. But the question is, where between 0 and 100% does the, does the fit have to be for it to be constitutional? So. Well, David uh, Fontana, welcome. That's why I appreciate you coming to Heritage today to Thank discuss you. this. Thank this you. is not an issue that's going away, particularly with the case before the US Supreme Court. If we could give them a round of applause. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming to Heritage.